Welcome to NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live, interactive learning at your desktop. Today's seminar is entitled Teaching NGSS in Elementary School, and today's seminar is focusing on kindergarten. Our presenters today are Carla Zembosol, Mary Starr, Kathy Renfrew, and Ted Willard from NSTA. My name is Christina Crawley, and I'm going to be moderating today's program. Jeff Lehman is online with us to provide technical support. Now, before we get started, I'd like to remind you to visit the NSTA Learning Center, your online portal for, for professional learning and over 11,700 resources for science educators. You'll find that over 4,100 of those resources are free and you can add them to your library to access when it's convenient for you. You can organize your resources by bundling them into collections or accessing thousands of other collections made by NSTA and other teachers. Feel free to join the conversation in the community forums where you can discuss content and classroom issues with other teachers. Our online advisors are available to help you find the information you're looking for and you're also welcome to use the free tool to help you organize your own professional development and meet your goals. It's all available at learningcenter.nsta.org. Now let's go ahead and introduce today's presenter. You've got the nice photos there to go along with it. First off, we've got Ted, uh, Ted Willard, who is joining us from NSTA. And then our teachers, we've got Carla, Mary, and Kathy joining us as well. And so with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Ted and let you guys take it from here. Thanks very much, Christina. Welcome, everybody. Happy to, really excited to be here at the start of this new school year and a new set of web seminars we're doing around the Next Generation Science Standards. want to uh, give you all just a little bit of a primer on the standards. Some of you, if you tend, especially if you attend any of the web seminars, this will be old hat for you, but I think for some of you, maybe some new information about the standards to be aware of. Four organizations were involved in putting together the standards. You've got the National Academy of Sciences, ACHIEVE, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and of course, my favorite, the National Science Teachers Association, the A2GO NSTA. <clears throat> There's a two-step process that went along in developing the standards. And you should be aware of this piece. The first part is the framework for K-12 science education, which was re released by the National Academies in July of 2011. There's the standards themselves. And those different pieces here lead to the development of curriculum, instruction, assessment, pre-service, and professional learning. All of these things here ha are affected by the standards. So let's look at that first element, the, the framework and talk a little bit about that. If you haven't seen the framework yet, if you haven't looked at it, if you haven't read it cover to cover, you need to do so. If you've already read it cover to cover, you need to go back and look at it some more. It really is the foundation upon which all of this work is, is based. Um, I strongly encourage you to take a look at it. And there's really no excuse. You can get a free copy of it from the National Academies Press, or you can get, buy a copy from NSTA Press in the Science Store. So the, the headline of this are the three dimensions and the idea of three-dimensional learning that we're going to talk about tonight. There are science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and disparate core ideas. Those are the three dimensions. The first of these pieces, the practices, are the things we want students to be able to do, the techniques they should need to have. These are the techniques that scientists have in the work they do. It involves things like asking questions, developing models, interpreting data, constructing explanations. All these things are key into, real into really being able to engage in science. The cross-cutting concepts, these are concepts that are not specific to biology or chemistry or physics, but are apparent in all the different disciplines in science. And so we have ideas like patterns, scale, systems, structure and function. These pieces all play out here are examples of those seven cross-cutting concepts. And then the core idea is probably the things you're most familiar with, you know, life science, physical science, earth and space science, 
and then engineering, which is put us alongside these other science disciplines so all together. And engineering is really infused into the next generation science standards. Each of these areas can be further broken down. So physical science is broken down into some smaller chunks. And each of those smaller chunks are broken down into even tinier chunks. So that's all described in the framework. But let's go on to the second piece here, the standards themselves. The standards were developed and coordinated by a group of 26 states, the states that are shown there in blue. And then there was a group of 41 writers, almost about half of, of whom were classroom teachers at the time they started. That gives you a sense of where they were spread out across the country. So really it has been sort of a national effort to make these standards. At this point, the standards were completed a couple of years ago, over a year ago. You've got 13 states that have adopted the ones that are outlined in green on that piece here, it's, and also the District of Columbia, which is probably too small for you to see on that map. But that represents almost 30% of students in the United States now live in a state that has adopted the next generation science standards, and more are, will be coming online in the, in the months and years to come. <clears throat> so let's take a look at one of these standards and get a really sort of a better idea of what's going on here. Um, I've got a standard here from kindergarten that we're looking at since we're talking about kindergarten tonight. This idea, plan and conduct an investigation to compare the effects of different strengths or different directions of pushes and pulls on the motion of an object. This is a description of what students should be able to do at the end. As I've gotten a note here, it's a description of what's to be to assess. This is not I repeat, not meant to tell you this is what you have to do in your classroom. You have choices to make in your classroom, or your district does, or your state does, about how that works out. This is just about to guide the folks who write the assessment. But what do you need to focus on, or how does this all fit together? You've got the practice represented here, plan and conduct investigation. And that's described more down here below. You've got a cross You've got core ideas, like the effects of different strengths and different directions of pushes and pulls and how they affect the motion of an object. Those are those core ideas about pushes and pulls that are described down here. And then you've got the cross-cutting concept of cause and effect and how the effects of these, of these pushes and pulls. And so all of those different pieces blend together and are assessed together in um, in the performance expectation, and work with the performance expectation. And instruction should really involve blending these things together as well. And with that, I'm thrilled to pass things on to, to Carla and Mary and Kathy to really kind of talk about what goes on in kindergarten in GSS. Here you go. Thank you, Ted. Um, welcome, everyone. We are so excited to see so many people here. We know it's the beginning of the school year, and things are very busy for you. So we appreciate you coming together to focus with us on teaching NGSS in elementary school with a focus on kindergarten. My name is Carla Zumblefall, and I'm a professor of science education at Penn State University. In my former life, I was a middle school science teacher in Houston, Texas. My research and practice is focused on teacher learning and development as it relates to engaging students in scientific practices and discourse. And much of my work is embedded in school university partnerships. And I recently authored the book, you may know this one, What's Your Evidence? Engaging K-5 Students in Constructing Explanations in Science. I did this with my um, collaborator, a teacher collaborator, Kimber Hirschberger, um, and a colleague from Boston College, Kate McNeil. I'm also serving on the National Research Council Consensus Panel for Strengthening Science Education Through a Teacher Learning Continuum. I'm also excited to be here with my uh, good friends and colleagues, Mary Starr and Kathy Renfrew. Mary? Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm Mary Starr, and I'm currently sitting in beautiful Charlevoix, Michigan on the shores of Lake Michigan, and I am the Executive Director of the Michigan Mathematics and Science Centers Network. We have 33 centers throughout the state that provide professional learning opportunities for um, all Michigan science and mathematics teachers. I'm also the co-author um, of Project-Based Inquiry Science, which is a middle school project-based science uh, curriculum which, and published by It's About Time. 
which I authored with actually two of the NGSS uh, writers that um, Ted pointed out on his map a few seconds ago. And most of my work is in, uh, revolved around professional development um, with middle school and elementary school teachers and um, working on pushing um, forward the ideas of the framework to Michigan's um, math and science uh, science teachers in um, throughout the state, which is a real challenge right now um, with uh, all the things that are surrounding all uh, the NGSS adoptions. All right, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Renfrew. Um, I'm currently the K-5 Science Coordinator for the Agency of Education in Vermont. Um, I wear a few different hats. I'm an NGSS curator, I'm an online advisor, I read manuscripts, I do a lot of things at the NSTA level um, just because I love it. I'm an NSTA groupie. Um, I also, in my former life, I was an elementary school teacher for a lot of years. Um, I taught grades four um, for about 15 years and grades five, six for about 15 years. So. With that, I think we're ready to start. Okay, let's get to work. Um, as many of you know, this is the first in a series of webinars on teaching NGSS in elementary school. And we had several um, important reasons for wanting to do this work. Um, the first relates to kids, and you know this from your own experiences with young children. They are born investigators who are really capable of some sophisticated scientific reasoning. And the research backs this up. The, um, Ted had mentioned the um, framework, um, which uh, allows us to think about some of these ideas in action. And so it also um, points, the research points, to the tight relationship between engaging in scientific practices and learning the science, and those are inextricably tied together. So that's a really important reason. There's also a lot of consensus around this idea that um, what you do um, in the early grades provides a foundation for future learning in science that is incredibly important. To date, um, NSTA has not um, done a number of seminars focused on elementary. They've done a couple, but um, we really wanted to have the opportunity to um, think about the challenges facing elementary teachers um, and how we can provide um, support and to this uh, point down here, um, developing a community of practice that's focused on teaching science in the early grades and provide access to instructional resources for teaching the science. Today, our agenda, um, our webinar is broken into three main parts. Um, the NGS topics um, for kindergarten, we'll take a look at those and focus in on weather and climate. We'll also work through making sense of the performance expectations for kindergarten. Um, part two, we're going to turn our attention to teaching weather in kindergarten. I have some video classroom practice and samples of classroom artifacts to share with you. Um, and finally, part three, our approaches and resources, resources for supporting NGSS in kindergarten. Um, but before we go any further, we'd like to get a sense of how familiar you are as participants in the webinar tonight um, with NGSS. Um, we have a little poll here. Um, we, we would like for you to um, uh, engage with the poll on the, on the very familiar end. Um, if you have had extensive professional development with NGSS and you're working towards implementation already in your classroom, not at all is pretty self-explanatory, and then pretty much everything in between. So, Christina, can you help us out with the polling tools, please? Uh, sure. And so for this one, I think that we can, if you'd like, we could go ahead and do exactly what people are doing and use the clip art and put that directly on the screen there. So between, so it's clear that it's either in the not all, you can go straight up that um, to the top of the screen if you like, and the somewhat in the very. So you don't have to stick right on that line, but you can also go ahead um, vertically there. So we'll give you a second, a few, a few, maybe another 20 seconds or so as, as people fill that in. And again, for those of you who joined us later, clip art is just on the right-hand side of the participants window. It's the last button in that series of eight or nine buttons. It looks like a little um, mountain in, a, in, a, in the sun there. You click on that, and then you can 
stamp directly onto the whiteboard. If you're having any trouble doing that, um, feel free to, to type it in the chat window. Well, it looks like there is quite a spread there, and from watching prior um, webinars, we anticipated that this might be the case, especially with an elementary focus. So we hope that we've planned something for everyone, um, from the most experienced adopters of NGSS to those who are really hearing about it for the first time. Um, so let's begin by taking a look at what NGSS means for kindergarten, and Mary is going to walk us through that. All right, so what we know about um, elementary school teaching is that often in the past we've been focused on making sure that our students were engaged in hands-on activities. We even have a word for it, right? We call it hands-on because we want the students to be really fo um, using materials and focused on um, working with stuff. Um, and what we are trying to do now with the NGSS is to begin to move beyond those activities because we've learned that just having kids do stuff is not going to be enough. So we're going to focus more on integration of those core ideas and the science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts that Ted um, described earlier and really look at how the activities that students are doing will help them to engage with phenomena and um, collect data in order to construct our arguments, which goes back to the um, science and engineering practices, as well as how they'll test ideas and um, create explanations. We really want them to be able to use the activities, the investigations that they do in the classroom to um, create a data sets and be able to test explanations. And all of those things should have predictive powers. And those are the kinds of, of investigations students will need to be doing in NGSS-aligned um, curriculum. And it moves beyond what we've been doing in the past, which um, it was a good step. And now we need to really focus on what's that next step. So when we look at those, um, the previous uh, hands-on activities, we were frequently focused on the carrying out investigations um, uh, science and in the science and engineering practices. So we probably got that one pretty well down. But what we're focused on now is over here at 6 and 7, which is more about um, developing explanations and um, engaging in argument from evidence. So Ted previously um, described the science and engineering practices. Carla, Kathy, and I wanted to make sure that everybody realizes that this numbering system on these on the practices really is just so that we can communicate with each other about what the practices are. So if I were saying, you know, we, we need to focus on practice six and seven now versus the carrying out investigations, which is in practice three, the numbers are not intended to show um, more importance to the uh, first or second uh, science and engineering practices or less importance to, to the ones at number um, seven or eight. They're just for, for an identification. And then we'll show um, in some of the um, upcoming slides the importance of how all of the science and engineering practices really work together in order to help give students chances to engage with scientific phenomenon in much the same way that scientists or in the case of several of the practices um, engineers uh, might actually do. So what we're trying to do is move past those activities and really engage students in opportunities to act um, like scientists. And what you'll also see as we come, as we move further into the um, webinar, is that sometimes the practices, because they are all linked together, sort of looks like um, that they're all happening at once. But we want to keep in mind that sometimes we, we will be foregrounding certain practices. So those will be more important while the students will actually be using the others. And um, those other practices would end up then to being sort of backgrounded. 
So in NGSS, there's um, three topics that will be the focus of all science learning for kindergarten. They include uh, forces and interactions, uh, pushes and pulls, that would be for the physical science, uh, inter interdependent relationships and ecosystems, that's a life science um, topic, and then the last one is the earth and space science topic, which is weather and climate. Um, it's last on our list. It's not necessarily last in any other way, uh, chronological or within the school year. It's just, this is just our list. Um, these topic areas are, will, are intentionally uh, uh, provided to kindergarten teachers because they, pr they give students a great opportunity to engage in some rich science um, investigations around phenomena. So in our webinar today, we selected the um, weather and climate focus. And there's a lot of reasons. Uh, first, one of the most important is that it's probably something that a lot of kindergarten teachers might be doing in their classroom already. So um, the performance expectations in kindergarten really are focused on um, having kids answer questions that might sound like, um, what is the weather like today and how is it different from yesterday? This uh, question is really helps kids focus on phenomenon and looking for patterns and variations in the weather. So the expectation is that we would answer, um, find answers to questions and that the, the answers would purposefully um, indicate to students that there are patterns and variations in local weather. All right, this is a, another page from the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, uh, Ted showed one previously, so they all look alike. Uh, you might see that they, this looks very similar. The uh, three colored boxes at the bottom, those are the foundation boxes um, with the science and engineering practices and the uh, disciplinary core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts. Then ideas from each of those um, Foundation boxes are um, bundled together, they're intertwined, and that's what makes the performance expectations. And the performance expectations are then showed at the, shown at the top. The yellow um, arrow indicates the performance expectation that we chose to focus on today. Uh, use and share observations of local weather conditions to describe patterns over time. Uh, one thing that we uh, didn't do at the beginning and I just missed also is to indicate, to show you, especially if you're at the not at all level, um, that there's this coding at the front of each of the, um, at each of the performance expectations. And you'll know that this is kindergarten because it starts with a K and then it's earth and space science. So that's ESS and then 2-1 indicates the, um, the performance expectation itself. So if you break out the performance expectation, uh, one critical piece, and as Ted said, this is the one that um, most people are very familiar with, the disciplinary core idea, because it, it harkens back to the kinds of things that we um, are used to seeing in standards. So um, this disciplinary core idea um, indicates for, uh, for you that there are some attributes of weather. It's a combination of sunlight, wind, rain, uh, snow, and temperature that we're worried about a particular region and a particular time. And then especially for kindergartners, we're going to focus on measuring those conditions in order to describe and record the patterns. Um, the, the, you probably are starting to hear a pattern in what I've been saying is this pattern idea is what's going to come out um, as a real strength of the disciplinary core idea and the performance expectation for kindergartners. And then the di disciplinary core idea is um, embedded within this performance expectation. Um, again, it's use and share observations of local weather conditions to describe patterns over time. One thing that you'll notice is when you read through this is there's um, two different statements. The first one is the clarification statement. And it gives you really clear ideas about, in this case, um, qualitative and quantitative data, so what would count as data, what would count as patterns, so it's really some great guidance about patterns um, that you might 
really develop in your classroom. And then uh, the assessment boundary that ex uh, explains what's the, what's the um, end point that you don't necessarily need to go past in order to have met the, the needs of assessment. That doesn't mean you couldn't go past for instructional purposes, but the assessment boundary is defined here as um, quantitative observation, observations, whole numbers. So for example, temperatures wouldn't be 72.5, and then relative measures such as warmer and cooler. Right? Um, it's really important to, to um, reiterate what Ted said earlier. These are performance expectations. All performance expectations are what the mark, the um, goal that we're trying to move students to through their experiences in science class for the end of instruction. So this is not intended to guide curriculum day-to-day um, -day lessons in your classroom, but more as the outcome of what um, we want students to know and be able to do at the end of kindergarten or the end of instruction. So it's really cool to be a, um, thinking about science in kindergarten is it's now absolutely the foundational um, Experience, science experiences for students. The next generation science standards have um, de been developed with the, uh, an idea of learning progressions. So students um, begin their ideas of um, science concepts and at the, at the um, kindergarten and um, primary levels and then move and use those same ideas in, the, in more sophisticated ways as they move through the grades. So while in kindergarten students would be measuring and noticing patterns over time. By the time they get to um, middle school, they would be really looking at more complex uh, interactions and focus on a more global view with regard to the impact of oceans on weather and climate. Um, they also, it's important to notice that in kindergarten, the patterns are in a particular place in a particular time and are really focused on weather. And the sophistication and idea, ideas move into more of an emphasis on climate as you move up um, through the grades, starting in grade three, and then um, building into the middle school. And of course, there are also um, high school standards. We just didn't want to um, include too much on our slide, but if you were interested in moving in looking at that progression all the way into high school. All right, so we're going to take a short um, pause here and um, have you answer some, some uh, give us your questions for um, if you have any ideas or confusions, uh, interesting um, comments about um, you know, the topics for kindergarten, so the life, the earth, and the physical topic, and the one we've picked is weather and climate. Or if you have any questions or concerns about making sense of the actual performance expectations. So I'm going to turn that back over to Christina now, and she's going to help with um, how you can ask your questions. Actually, I'm going to step in to help out with the questions here for, for a bit. And um, if folks would please uh, paste some question, your questions in the chat room. Um, Douglas has already started putting some things in here, and he's asking, He's heard numerous times that PEs are not intended to drive curriculum, but how can they not if the PE is what students will be expected to be able to do and demonstrate to, de to demonstrate understanding and proficiency? So can you explain how the, the PEs, ha you know, obviously are something we pay attention to, but aren't, you know, a mandate we have to follow blindly? If you would. Who wants to tackle that one? Mary, would you I'll like to? I'll try. Carla, great. Um, Kathy, great. Um, so the, the PEs are the performance expectations, and they are. You're right. They're assessment targets. They're what the kids are expected to do at the end of instruction. But how you choose to, to um, format or lay out that instruction, or how you choose to get your students to that particular performance expectation, that is a very much a local decision, um, a, a district, a school. Um, they're certainly not meant 
at that level to be um, curriculum. Thank you. Anybody else? Sounds like we're, sounds I like think we're ready to go. We, okay. we, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I think what we, that's okay, Chad. I think what we need to be um, aware of is that often we've looked at the standards, and this is partially true in Michigan. We've seen it in places where teachers have interpreted the standards as defining the activities that they're to do in the classroom. So it's like more like a checkbox. I did that activity, I got that covered. And the way I see the performance expectation is they are the goal, so that's like the bullseye. And then what, and my question then is, what can I do with my students to make sure that when the assessment time comes, they're able to do the pieces of within that performance expectation, which will require things like engaging with the science and engineering practices in multiple different ways throughout the school year. Great. Thanks. Um, I'm going to tackle just one very briefly here that Avra asked about, which are I missing? Life science, earth and space science, physical science, and then engineering te technology and applications of science is the fourth piece in, all, in the whole set. Um, Emily asks, and we can spend a whole, work, a whole web seminar on this one, but if, you want, if, a, if they're curious about, do you have any sense about what assessment for this would look like? Let me let me jump in with that one. If you're, what you're experiencing is uh, uh, three polite present presenters who don't want to talk over each other. Um, this is Carla. I, I I think one of the things that um, we're encouraged to do as we support students' learning and sense making um, in the spirit of NGSS and that new vision for science learning um, involves a great deal of formative assessments. So while I know that um, assessments are being um, developed, um, the ones that I think are going to be um, the most important in classrooms are the ones that teachers implement on a daily basis to see, um, to check for understanding, to get at children's ideas, to um, develop learning opportunities that move them towards the performance expectation in ways um, that really look a little different than the activity-based approach that um, Mary had talked about had talked about earlier. And actually, I'm wondering if um, Ted might want to speak to the assessments. I know you're not a presenter, but uh, um, I know you have a sense of what's going on. Uh, I think the, the, the key piece to be, to be aware of is what a lot of people who are experts, and I can, we can point you to a, a web seminar NSTA did on assessment that was based on some work the National Academy did. Um, a, a, first of all, what they probably can't be. And it, it's, NGSS isn't focused on definitions. It's not focused on, you know, probably filling in just a bubble that, you know, gives you, you know, an easy sort of thing to memorize. It's more about using practices in line with core ideas and cross-cutting concepts. The other big piece that a lot of people involved in this work, even at the assessment level are saying, is what we need to work on working towards assessments in the classroom, formative assessments, and slowly work from that build out to what state assessments would be like or larger scale assessments would be like rather than starting with the state level and pushing down into the classroom that the, the really pieces are sort of pushing in that direction. Um, so that is, so I'm going to suggest that we continue on here. I'll try to collect up some of the questions that we've got in place, um, and but we'll t take another question break Thanks, a little bit. Thanks, Ted. It also looks like we're getting some really good suggestions and ideas from participants that I hope we'll be able to capture. Um, as we move into this next poll, this marks the beginning of part two of the webinar, which focuses on teaching weather in kindergarten. So we thought we'd begin by asking you about your experiences teaching weather or observing weather being taught. And while I know um, that some of you will have answers that fall in more than one of these categories, we're asking for the one that best reflects how you taught weather or observed it being taught. And that if you select other, if you could type in the chat box um, what some of those other ways of, of teaching weather um, are that you've experienced. Um, Christina, can you help us out with the polling tool? Yeah. 
So we're going to go ahead and use the polling tool. So try to use that rather than the chat box um, to answer the A, B, C, D part. And so that's just going to be below your name. Um, you're at the top of the participants window and you've got those four boxes. It's the one on the far right that says A. And then you can just drop down once you click on it and pick between A, B, C, D, E. And as mentioned, um, if you did click on E, go ahead and put that there. And then if you want to explain it in the chat box, um, go ahead and do that. So we'll give you just another um, another you know, 20 seconds or so to, to work on that. If you accidentally picked the wrong answer, just open it up again and switch to whichever answer you wanted to do. So we'll just give a few more seconds on that. And then I will publish the uh, results to the whiteboard. And then, um, and then you guys can take it from there. All right, so let's take a look at this. Um, I'm seeing um, these working out quite a bit here. E um, is showing us, if I'm looking at other, um, I'm noticing that there's a lot of combination B and C. Um, this is really very consistent with the way that um, we have seen um, weather taught in kindergarten classrooms. Um, we've done some informing, uh, um, informal polling of lo local teachers, and we found it quite common for them to have their children um, record weather information or weather observations as part of their daily calendar routine. So we actually decided to focus on that particular activity uh, or way of teaching about weather in kindergarten and consider how to rethink it in light of the performance expectation that Mary presented earlier um, from NGSS. So thank you for your participation in the poll. So Mary pointed this out, um, but recall that the performance expectation emphasizes qualitative and quantitative observations about weather. And I think one of the nice reminders here is that sometimes we can get caught up in thinking about um, data as numerical measurements, for example, but uh, it clearly is um, desirable for students to be able to make qualitative observations and to consider that as being um, data. And um, we see these kinds of observations being made frequently during the morning meeting and or calendar math, um, those kinds of activities in classrooms. But that second piece that Mary was talking to you about of the performance expectation um, is examining observations for patterns over time. That's also part of the um, performance expectation. And we have found that that is much less common for students to be able to use their daily observations to identify those patterns um, as part of traditional instruction. So with that, um, we went out and um, I was able to talk to a local teacher collaborator. Um, here's my disclaimer. Um, the video that you are about to watch was recorded in central rural Pennsylvania. If you drive um, t outside of our town 10 minutes in any direction, you're either going to be in a state park or on a dairy farm. So just keep that in mind when you look at the, um, the population of students that we're serving. Um, but I, I do want to say that I feel very privileged to have um, school colleagues who are willing, um, and not only willing, but generous and brave enough um, to open up their classrooms to us so that we can observe and learn from them. Um, it's not intended, what you see is not intended to be perfect science teaching, but rather very authentic science teaching. Um, the teacher really is a kindergarten teacher, and she's been teaching that uh, level, uh, that grade level for many years now. And you have to realize that we did this uh, filming at the beginning of this school year, um, which really is very early, um, very early on. Many of these children in the class, it's their very first formal school experience. So in my opinion, Mrs. Dillon um, is a superhero, and I am asking for your deep respect when reflecting on her teaching, which we'll be asking you to do afterwards. I also want to give a shout out to um, Dr. Alicia McDyer, who provided instructional support for us to be able to collect this video in the classroom, and Susie Kressinger, um, who I see is uh, one of our participants tonight, um, for her video recording in the classroom. 
But it's important to note um, before we actually get into the video that uh, before the lesson that you're about to see, which is the sixth science lesson of the year, which happened in the third week of class, that the teacher and the students had already done a great deal of really important work together to lay the foundation for what you're going to see. The class is engaged with weather as phenomena by considering how it affects their daily plans and activities, such as recess. They have identified the attributes of weather and decided to focus on temperature because they know they can measure it. They've learned to use and read a thermometer and have noticed that the temperature is different in the morning and the afternoon. They've considered ways to record data, and the teacher has introduced other sources of weather information from the newspaper and the online sites um, that uh, provide the weather forecast. And students took a look at that, and they realized that their um, data was different than what was being reported. And so they really wanted to talk to a meteorologist and find out how a scientist goes about um, measuring temperature and what tools they use and when they do that and when they report a high and low, how do they figure that out. So the kids have actually written a letter to um, a local meteorologist. AccuWeather is located in our area, so um, we had access to that. So all of this has happened leading up to this lesson that you're about to see. As you're watching the um, video clip, it's about a five minute clip, we um, ask you to think about, um, we think it's useful to think about what the teacher's doing and what students are doing. And so there are a couple of prompts here um, that may be helpful to you um, as you're watching the video. We're going to ask you to respond in the chat box about some of the things that you're noticing. So um, the reflection question that we're going to use after the video is over is um, we want to think about the ways in which the teacher supported children in developing towards the performance expectation that we've been talking about. So we'll discuss your responses after the video. Um, Christina, can you jump back in and explain how the video component is going to work? Yes, definitely. So for everyone in the room, I'm going to push the video towards you so it's going to open automatically into a browser. Um, once you see that browser pop open, you're just going to have to click on play and then the video will start. Once you've finished uh, watching the video, you come back into the room here um, and in the poll button area where it used to say A, B, C, D, E, there's now a green check or a red X. So when you're back at the room, you've finished watching the video, go ahead and give us a green check. And once we have mainly everyone back in the room, um, then we'll, we'll get started again. So if someone just clicked it there, that gives you an example. Um, so that's what you would do once you've finished watching. So we'll go ahead and do that. I'll also put the uh, link in the chat box um, afterwards once I've pushed it in case anyone's had any trouble. Okay, here we go.
So as you write in the in the chat box, I'm noticing a, a lot of people um, appreciated. Um, Mrs. Dillon is a teacher. Um, she is very good and very brave, like I said, to allow us in during the first couple days of class here. Um, I see a lot about the kinds of questions that she's asking and her ability to relate um, children's uh, experiences with the phenomena to their real world experiences around, you know, wearing a jacket. They weren't quite ready to think about the, the pattern in the data that they had been collecting yet, but they could relate to their everyday experience. And um, I'm also noticing that some people weren't able to watch the video, so I really apologize for that. We'll have to get that worked out. Um, some of the things that she does in terms of her classroom management are very nice. Thinking like scientists, very important. Using scientific terminology with the children. Um, modeling for them the way that scientists think and why. And I hope what you noticed in the video is that when they went over, I mean, you would think that they were opening a surprise package or something um, at the point where they got up and looked out the window to see it. They're very excited about trying to understand the weather phenomena. So it's. Um, it's really, uh, a, it, it, I think it's a really interesting way to think about in one uh, little clip all of the things that would have had to have happened to get to the point where the teacher could actually pull this off. And we highlighted, for those of you who weren't able to get to the video, a few of these highlights um, I captured in this slide. One of those around the talk moves uh, we will get to um, quite soon here. It's, it's pretty important to think about the talk moves. So thank you for your, your ideas um, about the video clip. In the upcoming webinars, we will also try to have video clips available to, uh, uh, to demonstrate or illustrate the various practices and give us something to reflect on together. I'm going to skip this uh, next poll. It's kind of a trick question anyhow. We were going to ask you where patterns in data or looking for patterns in data come in in terms of the scientific practices, uh, scientific and engineering practices from the NGSS. Um, the answer, uh, if there is one, it maps most nicely onto analyzing and interpreting data, but um, none of these practices uh, take place in a vacuum. So our major point here is that the practices, the scientific practices, rely on one another. You can't analyze data and interpret it if you don't have it. So you have to plan and carry out investigations, which require asking really good questions. Once you have data and it's been analyzed, you can use that to construct explanations and arguments. So these all work together synergistically. And it turns out that this notion of working with data is actually really rich in terms of um, students making meaning of phenomena. So in their book, Investigating Real Data, Rich Lair and Leona Schauble outline several important points about working with data. First is that data are constructed to answer questions about phenomena, and they're very clear that developing those really good research questions is challenging. And then defining the variables embedded in those research questions can take a lot of time with students. But working through this is part of the learning process, and it's incredibly important, so don't short-circuit that uh, or short-change that part of the process. The second point is making sense of data involves defining and measuring attributes and structuring data. The kids had to figure out what they were going to observe about the weather and how they were going to measure it in the example that we showed. And then this other piece is also very important, representing and visualizing data. That can support the sense-making process. So that allows um, uh, or facilitates, rather, the process of data analysis. So, even though the video that we saw was at the beginning of the year, you might be able to imagine that temperature data collected across an entire school year might look something like this. Um, this is actually real data from one of Kathy's teacher collaborators in Vermont, um, and you can tell by the dates that it was collected over the entire school year last year. So visualizing the data above and below the freezing line allows students to identify daily, monthly, and seasonal patterns. So we're now shifting into part three of uh, the webinar, and um, we want to take a moment to come up for air and acknowledge that teachers, there's a lot that teachers need to know to be able to pull this off in the classroom. 
Um, and so we are going to be focused on the kinds of approaches and resources that can help you with implementing this, um, or the vision of NGSS in your classroom. So the, there are a few approaches that we have found in our work with teachers and other colleagues that are useful in moving towards that vision of NGSS in the classroom. Um, we want you to keep in mind that um, this is not a race. Um, you're going to take it slow. You're going to be intentional and thoughtful. Um, the idea is to really um, try and find out what resources and approaches are out there and available to you and which ones might be useful to you tomorrow versus which ones you might work on over an incredibly long amount of time. So the three areas that we're going to work on are at least mentioned tonight and that will be taken up in subsequent webinars in a little more detail are the claims, evidence, and reasoning framework. We're going to also look at talk moves for supporting rich classroom discourse and the shift in emphasis from activities to creating a coherent content storyline. So one of the... Um, one of the things that we have learned is with the simple shift from what Mary showed you with um, activities often falling out um, in the area of scientific practices around planning and carrying out investigations, if you can make the simple shift, it's not so simple, I shouldn't frame it like that, it's a complex shift, but if you can make the shift to focusing on explanations and argument that are grounded in evidence, that can help move you towards NGSS in the classroom. And so what NGSS means by explanation and argument, um, and this is actually from the NGSS document, is that constructing scientific explanations are using observations and science ideas to construct evidence-based account for the phenomena. It's the how and why the natural phenomena happen. Whereas arguing or argument from evidence is the process of reaching agreement about explanations. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here about the kinds of things that um, make up that negotiation, which is argumentation, um, but you can see here that there are lots of opportunities for sense making. The claims evidence reasoning rebuttal um, framework is one that um, allows you to get that focus on giving priority to evidence in the service of constructing arguments and explanations. This work in particular comes from Joe Krejcik and Kate McNeil. I actually like this representation a lot better, so we'll focus on that one for the moment. But the idea with claims evidence reasoning framework is that you engage kids with interesting phenomena that gets them really um, uh, excited about what they're going to be learning about. You ask questions that require or craft questions that require investigation. You collect evidence that allows you to construct claims and weigh those claims against other claims that might be used to answer those questions. And you draw on scientific reasoning or scientific principles to strengthen your explanation. And while it's one thing to talk about that, I think it's um, nice to be able to show it. So if we return to the data set that we were looking at before, the daily temperature record from across a school year, the question is how does temperature vary over time? And so one of the, um, uh, one way that kids might describe this um, is that when we started the school year in September, it was warm. Then it became cooler. And it was coldest in January and February, and then it became warmer again, and by the time school is ending in May or June, it's really hot. So that might be a kindergarten-style description of what those data say, which we would talk about as being the evidence. But now you can imagine from that evidence that kids could craft a claim that sounded like something like this. The temperature changes a little from day to day, changes are bigger when we look over time. That is actually leveraging this evidence to be able to write a claim that responds to the question that's under investigation. And then when we layer on reasoning, again, this wouldn't happen overnight, and this speaks to the point of the performance expectation targeting what kids are able to do by the end of instruction. Because here, by the end of the year, and by looking at these data over time, kids will have learned something about seasonal changes and how that impacts how temperature varies. 
And you can imagine that it's probably incredibly difficult um, to get kids to not have the teacher tell what this explanation is, but to have kids construct this explanation from their evidence. Um, it takes really rich classroom discourse. And so Kathy is going to walk us through some talk moves that may be helpful to you in your own classroom. So <clears throat> why, why is talk so important? So one of the things that um, I think about a lot is that by talking with each other, students are going to become so much better at developing claims about phenomena such as weather that's supported by evidence. And by us providing them with those opportunities um, to talk about their investigation, to hear the evidence and, and the developing reasoning of their peers, um, by doing this, we're going to help our students uh, by making time for this, we're going to help our students deepen their own understandings. Um, scientist meetings such as the ones that we saw in this video lets us, the teachers, know what a student is really thinking about. You know, building academic vocabulary is huge. We saw this in the video. The teacher probed until the students got to the word degrees. It wasn't cats, 78 cats and dogs, it was 78 degrees. She knew it was important for the students to use that correct unit when describing that temperature. She talked about the scientific data as well as other examples. So one thing we didn't really see, but sometimes students could be working in a science notebook. They could have a piece that they were doing there. When students are engaged in science discourse, they're not only learning science, but they're working on the common core standards in ELA. Of, they're practicing speaking and listening. There was also a connection to mathematics um, that we saw here when, with the degrees and that probing for units. Um, make, there was practice six, I believe. It's attending to position in mathematics, uh, um, the vocabulary of above, below, higher, lower. So that's really important as we um, think about that. So talk in the classrooms is very, very important. So here's an example of talk moves. It's, this chart came from Ready, Set, Science. Um, and in this book, um, their help, this book really lays out um, some ways to help us understand meaning making through classroom discourse. Um, and this particular book and this chart is also a product of the research that has happened um, getting, to, um, getting to actual practice. Um, during the video, we saw our example of some of these talk moves. One of the ones that we really saw right here um, is that prompting students for further information. Now that teacher didn't, Mrs. Dillon didn't ask those exact questions, but she was still prompting her students for further participation in the conversation. And here we have another chart. And this chart is actually from Carla's book, um, What's the Evidence? Um, Constructing Explanations with K-5 to um, K-5 Students in Science Classrooms. And um, through this, we looked at we looked at analyzing data. But I don't want to spend too, too much time here. One of the important pieces that I want to talk about here is the fact that Young children often get distracted and fidgety and move. Um, but this teacher did an awesome job of getting those students to really be focusing on what they're doing. And she did this by having a guiding question. So is it always going to be 78 degrees on Wednesday? Hmm. I wonder. She asked things like, what about the temperature for tomorrow or for today? Is it going to be the same as what we've seen? Is it going to be that? Is it going to be different? The other thing that we need to remember here is that um, it's really important um, 
to think about science talk as an opportunity for us as teacher to think about what our students are understanding as a formative assessment. Um, and so one more time, it's so critical to give our students those opportunities um, to converse as scientists. And now we're back to Mary. OK, so one of the things that we wanted to do is come back around to the beginning part and um, refocus uh, on, the, uh, on the shift to moving beyond the activities that we've been doing and um, really getting kids engaged with a phenomenon. In this case, the phenomenon has been um, weather and climate. And um, we wanted to remind you, we're going to take this as a little commercial, um, that these are the, the kinds of activities and discussions that we're going to have in each of the webinars, so in the first grade through the fifth grade webinars. But we're going to pick, um, we've already selected different performance expectations that will foreground different um, science and engineering practices. So um, if th this time we did um, uh, two of the practices really as the focus, uh, collecting and analyzing data, and um, constructing arguments and explanations. So if you are interested in the other, um, how the other uh, science and engineering practices will play out in the elementary school, we'd like to invite you to come back. Um, so this is uh, my, my vision of what it looked like when we were teaching um, the topic of weather using the really cool activities that we've been using um, for the last, you know, several years or at least maybe a decade. And it's, it's in purposefully intended to um, show sort of this mix of activities that we might have picked um, and done some and left some off. And, and um, the shift now to really developing what we do in the classroom with students to include um, some type of a question that the students would answer. So uh, uh, in this case, how does weather change from day to day? and really developing the storyline idea around um, how do we carefully scaffold and sequence the investigations and, and um, activities that students do in the classroom so that they are developing um, their understanding of the disciplinary core idea and the science and industry practice towards being able to meet that um, performance expectation. So um, it might seem like the storyline uh, sort of hems you in and gets, and some teachers might think that that um, takes away some of their creativity. But in fact, what we know is that when we carefully um, sequence the investigation, then students will learn more and they'll be able to build on their understandings. And that, in fact, there are multiple ways. So this might be one way to um, sequence investigations. And here's the exact same set of investigations. And there, there might be um, multiple ways to, to put them in an order that makes sense and supports student learning. There also might be multiple um, entry points into that storyline. So here's one entry point. You might start with uh, graphing the weather on a daily basis. Or you might even think about, um, building weather collection tools and, and really focusing on the tools of, of weather and forecasting. So um, one, one uh, point we also wanted to make sure that we reiterated is um, we focus in our webinar on one performance expectation. But you could imagine if you looked at the Next Generation Science Standards that there are multiple performance expectations that might come up if you're really having kids investigate um, these uh, these ideas. So, and answering this, um, you know, a question like how does weather change from day to day? And if you flip, if you were to flip back to the um, NGSS page that we showed at the beginning of the webinar, you would see that there weren't just Earth and Space Science um, uh, performance expectations on that page, but also physical science expectations. So we're really interested in making sure that um, the performance expectations are not taught one-to-one, -one, but we look for opportunities to bundle them together so that students learn about the phenomenon in um, sophisticated ways. So when we started, 
70 minutes ago, or approximately, we said that these were the goals of our webinars. Mary just talked a little bit about the emphasis on the PE, and that emphasis on the PE is to support meaningful science instruction, meaningful science opportunities. And we also want to, again, one more time, think about the fact that kindergarten is the basis, it's the foundation for all the future learning. Um, the focus on data integrates extremely well with mathematics, as well um, when you're thinking about language. Um, one of the things I actually went and thought about a lot of this and did some research, and the, there's a, real, a quote here from the Common Core State Standards. As students discuss these situations and compare objects using different attributes, they learn to distinguish label and describe several measurable attributes of a single object. This was so well demonstrated in that video. Well, when we thought about, think about all of the conversation that was happening within that classroom, that speaking and listening is being practiced, and explanations are being constructed, and there is the beginning or the development of, of practice within the classroom that integrates the ELA common, um, integrates the ELA common core state standards. So one of the things that's really important for all of us, the three of us, is that, that this webinar is just the start. We really do want to start the, a community of practice that's focused on the elementary grades. We want to share, use this webinar as part one to help us all share and access instructional resources for teaching, developing a community of practice. And I think one of the best ways and the best places to do that is right here in NSTA's Learning Center. Um, there are forums where great discussions can, can happen as we look at this particular piece, the things that many of you need to be very aware of is the learning opportunities, resources and opportunities, and your library, which is the place where you'll save all of these neat things that we have talked about, and things that you'll think about. It's not just the neat stuff that we're hoping to provide. It's also the conversations that we hope we create among all of us as learners. Um, I did start a conversation um, for teaching NGSS in kindergarten, and I put it in the Early Childhood Forum. And so that has started there. I also put a little piece in the elementary um, forum. And with that, I'm going to tell you about a few more things. I also created or created a collection that has many things in there. Um, there are science articles, journal articles from science and children. There's some ideas for different um, resource books, informational texts that you might use. There's some links to websites. If you think you need, it's been a long time since you've taught weather and climate and you really want to think about that, again, from a scientific, from scientific learning as an adult, I've also put connections to sci packs, sci objects, sci guides. We really hope one more time that this is just the beginning of the conversation between all of us. And with that, oh, I forgot one more resource that I want to talk about, and it's a little bit outside of NSTA, but there is an NGSS chat um, every other Wednesday, I believe, or Thursday, I believe, and the next one is on 925 at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, and we hope some of you who are regular everyday tweeters will join us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy. Thanks. So here's our setup for the for the rest of the evening. Here, I'm going to uh, 
give you a few points here in terms of some other places, resources that NSTA has. We're then going to have you take your sur survey um, feedback, and then Carla and Mary and Kathy will be available for some further questions that we'll we'll do, um, and we'll we'll go from there. But you know, start off with on the web here. You've got the nextgenscience.org. That's the official site for the standards. You also can find the standards at nsta.org/ngss. The NGSS at NSTA hub, which I'm biased, but I think is the source for all information around NGSS. You can probably find more information there than you can find anywhere else. Um, point out some other places to connect or collaborate. Um, we've got the discussion forum on NGSS in the Learning Center. We've got and this, a member-only listserv on NGSS as well. And so we've got just some different places here to go and find information and, com and communicate with some of the people. Continue the chats that you've had here that have been so so good. We've, this is, as you all know, is our first web seminar in the elementary series. We'll be coming back here October 15th and talking about first grade. If you found this to be a valuable experience, I would really encourage you to come back yourself. I think you'll learn some new things. I would really encourage you, those who are kindergarten teachers or whatever teachers, to encourage first grade teachers that you know to come and so on through all of these pieces. If you can only attend one, ten, attend your spe the one specifically for your grade. But I, I think I find them all interesting. And I don't even teach elementary school. Um, also, especially for those of you who this is your first web seminar to attend, we've got a whole slew, more than 30 different web seminar seminars we've done over the last several years. So if you want more information on the practices, we have one on each of the eight practices. We've got one on each of the seven cross-cutting concepts around the different sorts of core ideas and different pieces. We also have a number of articles about NGSS and the standards and the implementation in our various journals. So you can peruse back issues of those as well as looking at the new issues. Speaking of the practices, on Saturday, November 15th, we're going to be doing an all-day virtual conference. It will be a series of web seminars on different topics that are involved with um, the practices. Um, I think a really valuable piece in terms of things. Um, $79 if you're an NSTA member. Non-members are $99. You can find information about it at the following link. Um, really valuable place to pull all this up. From the bookstore, we have the framework and the standards. All obviously, we've got reader's guides to the framework and to the standards. Um, a nice book about how you translate, how you shift from the standards into your instruction. Those are all existing publications. We've got some things that have come out new this summer. Um, a piece here on professional development around NGSS, um, introducing teachers and administrators to the next generation science standards. Just hot off the presses, um, hard to teach biology concepts um, for aligning instruction to the NGSS. And then, not yet released, and something I'm very excited about because I was the editor of it, is a bunch of different quick reference guides that have single pages about what the standards are for kindergarten or second grade, third grade, and slices and dices of standards in a couple different ways. It's a really good um, companion or quick uh, a reference guide to the standards. You can find the different elements of the practices, cross-cutting concepts, and, and so on to work with. Um, if you like working with your mobile device, you can get the standards on an app, an NGSS app. And finally, talk about some of the conferences. We're going to be next month in Richmond, Orlando, Florida, and then Long Beach, California. That's this fall. Hope to see some of you are there. I'll be at all three. We'll have our national conference in Chicago and a STEM forum in Minneapolis next spring. And looking a little bit farther down to sort of see where we're going to be and when we'll be near you, the fall of 2015, Reno, Philly, and Kansas City, Missouri. And so that's the, the whole setup through all of these pieces. And with that, I'm going to pass things off to Christina. Um, really thank all of you for being here and thank uh, Carla, Mary, and Kathy for what I think was just a fantastic presentation.
Okay, great. I'm just going to switch back to that slide for a second. Why don't everybody um, go ahead and use that emoticon button. So that's just a smiley face that's underneath your name and find the applause button. And let's give a little virtual applause to all of our speakers today um, for such a for getting through all that information and doing it so eloquently. Um, that was really good and taking some time for questions and uh, and also being available after the survey for questions as well. So that was really great. Huge thanks to all of you. In addition to thanking our presenters, um, we'd also like to thank the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation of New York who are um, our sponsors for today's web seminar. So very grateful for the support there to make this uh, web seminar happen. And then finally to um, the NSTA team, so both the um, executive uh, directors as well as the web seminar team, which is also including uh, Jeff Lehman, who's here with us helping with technical uh, support. So huge thanks to everybody there. Um, that was, it was really great. So you can find resources related to today's presentation by going to the web seminar collection in the NSP Learning Center. I'll go ahead and put the link to that in the chat box there. Um, that's going to include the archive of the web seminar and the presentation slides. So in case you have some colleagues who weren't able to make tonight, they can go um, to, into the Learning Center, find those links, and watch the, the recording. Um, also included in the collection um, could be some journal articles and lesson plans, uh, potentially interactive content modules called Science Objects and SciPack and links to other helpful websites and multimedia. So be sure to have a look at that collection. And of course, for those of you who are joining us live and you've registered for the program, you are going to be receiving an email within the next day or two um, with the link for you to, to access the archive as well as the collection. Now here's a look at what's coming up on the web seminar calendar. So um, for those of you who were there at the beginning of the, during our introduction, we've got on September 18th, the sweet side of chemistry. On September 25th, do-it-yourself air monitoring. And on the 1st of October, um, kind of hard to believe, it's already jumping to October, uh, teach STEM, STEM skills in your classroom. Uh, so, and that's using the e-cyber mission. So you're welcome to go to learningcenter.nsta.org slash web seminars. That's going to give you the full list of upcoming seminars as well as any past seminars. So in case in the future you're not able to make a seminar, you can always go to the full list and find the archives and recordings. So never feel too bad if you can't make all of those seminars. And with that, I'm going to um, stop our recording. Thank you very much again for coming, and we look forward to seeing you again at another NSTA Web Seminar.